Hi, everybody. Thank you for sticking with us today. It's always exciting finding out that you're going to be um, number nine of nine talks on Zoom. And I'm excited to see a lot of us here. And thank you, Brandon, for that great presentation. I think that our two presentations connect fairly well. Um, education and training is also very much a, a cross-cutting issue across um, all of the programs, which is sort of the theme of our ongoing afternoon talk. And so, hang on, there, that works. Um, we spent most of the morning learning about a lot of research within our specific programs. Um, what is not often actually as well understood is part of the original RFP for CSAFE 1.0 was to create an education and training infrastructure and probabilistic methods for practitioners, uh, non-practitioners and stakeholders, which as, um, as academics and educators was a part that we've taken very much as seriously as the rest of our mandate to work on the methods themselves. Uh, this is an interesting line, which we spent some time thinking about when developing programs, practitioners, non-practitioners, and stakeholders is a large group. And the areas that we've ended up focusing on um, that we feel like compromise or, um, comprise our primary stakeholders, as in this area, are students, practitioners, and legal professionals. Um, Students in a number of areas, students in forensic science, which we'll talk about more in uh, 2.0, are obviously the future practitioners, they're the future professionals. Practitioners are the core client for CSAFE um, throughout. Working with the practitioner community is, is, a, is a key part of our mandate and increasing understanding of probabilistic methods in this community, working with um, the community on developing, understanding, and uptake of methods has been a core part of our permission of our mission and as Brandon just nicely laid out, the legal profession are the consumers of, of this evidence, the consumers of reports and testimony. And so understanding statistics and probabilistic issues are sort of key on every level here. And we have over time developed programs in each of these areas. Um, a lot of our initial successes have been with training students. We are um, all professors across CSAFE in various disciplines as Brandon highlighted. And I'm, um, I'm actually a little bit in the position of how this morning and that I'm going to be highlighting a lot of work that was done before I got engaged. I've gotten more engaged recently with, with the educational component as we're moving into 2.0, but we've had a great deal of success in 1.0. Um, and starting with students, we've had courses at three of our core universities, um, specifically designing courses on statistics and forensic science. At UVA, uh, a lot of work went, and this is Jeff Holt's work, a lot of work went into designing courses to engage statistics students in forensic issues. Um, in that case, sort of allowed, that pipeline is you know, engaging uh, future statisticians in these issues, the future forensic statisticians, the future CSAFE researchers of tomorrow. Across all of the campuses, this is not so much highlighted in this slide, um, we've had great success training graduate students as well. They're, they become our sort of core research groups in many areas, and a good number of our graduate students have now um, moved on. We have uh, Maria Cuellar, whose work with Heike was highlighted this morning, Amanda Luby, who's at Swarthmar now working um, on understanding proficiency tests for graduate students at CSAFE institutions at Carnegie Mellon, and we've had others move on. Um, so very specifically at UVA, we've had a huge number of workshops and have now piloted a semester. Jeff Holt has piloted a semester-long course, which he'll be updating. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and we've had a really successful course for undergraduate criminology students that Simon Cole has taught several times at UCI, and I believe Bill Thompson taught a version of this class actually prior. Um, it's now been taught, and Naomi uh, Kaplan, a uh, postdoc at UC Irvine, has taught that as well. Uh, Maria Cuellar at Penn has now taught a course on statistics and forensic science issues twice there. So um, we've had a lot of success and good feedback from students on these courses. And moving forward, um, we're going to be sort of expanding our undergraduate offerings. We'll all talk about this in a minute and our, and our graduate offering. But we've sort of directly touched more than 550 students through all of these classes, um, seeing the field. So bringing these issues in early in people's careers so that as they develop as practitioners in any number of areas, they bring these ideas with them into their work. And we've developed core materials now. Um, and I'll talk about this in 2.0, but that really tie in 
for core statistic and probabilistic issues with forensic examples. So we now have, we're developing, we have and are, are building out sort of a, a core, bet, core uh, I can't think of the word, batch of teaching material that can be used and adapted to other audiences moving forward. So that's been a real success. And then uh, just one more quick slide on this. Um, one of the things we're really proud of is our summer undergraduate research experience programs. Um, both Carnegie Mellon and CMU in uh, CSAFE 1.0 have hosted students for two month long, eight week sort of summer programs where they come, there's a coursework component and there's an applied research component. Generally, it's about 50% statistics students and 50% forensic science students and they get paired together in teams of mixed backgrounds where they get to, to learn from each other. The statisticians learn about forensic science, the forensic students learn about statistics and then they get to apply them on applied research topics, working with graduate students. Um, you know, here's one of, one of the cohorts and here they are presenting their posters. We've gotten really positive feedback from the students um, about, you know, how they've been affected directly. And it's a core way that CSAFE has been working to sort of expand our reach beyond our direct institutions. We all have educational programs that we all teach in and are able to build classes in, but this really has helped us reach a much broader range of schools. Um, and we have a really, a good network we're very proud of with uh, forensic science programs around the country with historically minority serving institutions that have really helped us bring in um, terrific cohorts every year from pretty much across the US. I, I actually really pared down uh, the list of universities. My first one, it took up all of the slides and then I was just trying to give an example, but it's still kind of too many to really read in a bullet point. But, um, you know, from the East Coast, the West Coast, from Puerto Rico, we have, um, really brought in a lot of students, which we're very excited about. And then obviously sort of the, the bread and butter of CSAFE is working with the practitioner community, which shows our core clientele. Um, so Brandon just really highlighted research engagement uh, across things, but we've also do a great number of trainings. Um, generally, uh, Alicia Garakiri and Hal Stern have done a lot of this. Karen Capitar has done trainings, a number of our a number of our individual, a number of our core PIs have done trainings with labs, with lab consortiums. Um, at this point, largely by request, we get we get requests. Can you come present? And we can come do full day trainings, half day trainings, hour long, ninety minute trainings. Um, we've also done a lot of work at professional conferences at the IAI. Uh, Alicia and her team ran, I think, a day and a half training uh, at the beginning of AAFS in February this year, um, sort of the last time we can still travel for this kind of stuff. And we have a number of practitioners very involved with OSAC. And then as we've progressed and as we've built out the research base that you saw discussed this morning, it's, it became really clear that um, we wanted to be able to reach audiences beyond just when PIs were able to travel. I mean, we also, as our PIs are also professors teaching classes, et cetera. And the webinar series um, has been a really great avenue for that. Since 2017, we started about halfway through that year, I think we've had 17 webinars um, on average there. Were, oh, maybe we started in 2018, but there have been uh, 17 so far. Uh, we've averaged 65 site, rec site registrations, most of those, um, you know, multiple people, it's in a conference room, and a good number of recorded views every single event. We've revamped our website. Um, I have the notes in the presenter view, which I can't see, but it's roughly, I think we had 11,000 separate views in 2018, and that was a 250, that was just over a 250% increase over the previous year. Uh, we have a a great communications director um, and a regular newsletter that has over 433 subscribers. And then we really built out our website also to collect our research from across all of the programs that you've heard about today. So um, obviously we do try to reach different communities directly with webinars, white papers. A lot of our research is published in academic journals. That does include uh, JFS, FSI, Journal of Forensic Science, Forensic Science International, uh, law and probability, so law risk and risk, um, as well as animal applied statistics and others. But we've really tried to build out access on our website so that you can go directly to our website to access papers directly. And I don't know if everything's there yet, or if, I mean, 
I know a lot is, and it may still be a work in progress. Um, so we're, we're really have been, we've been really pleased with how this, go, how this has gone, um, in particular the fact that, you know, we are now doing trainings at a, at a, frequently at a by request level. That means people have heard of us. Um, so we're really happy with that. And we have a lot of ideas for how we want to move this forward and how we want to adapt moving forward that I'll talk about in a minute. Okay, moving right along. And then so sort of at the, the far side of the pipeline that I showed at the beginning, uh, educating legal community. Um, and a lot of this is very related to the presentation that we just saw. Um, but we've had a, a great deal of success here as well. In particular, I think, um, I think Brandon, you just mentioned this, but the mock trial short course um, is, is an immersive interactive training experience um, that takes several days where Brandon and his team at Duke, I think he started this at UVA, um, bring in 15 to 20 law students and legal professionals for an actual immersive interact interactive experience where they get to they engage with a, an actual forensic practitioner, develop a mock case with, with testimony and a report and uh, a whole mock trial where students get to work through all of these issues and learn how they can actively engage with forensic science, what kinds of questions they can ask, um, you know, how admissibility works, et cetera. And that's been a really core component. And um, my understanding is that, I don't know if that's been offered. I know Brandon makes his materials available. I don't know if that's been offered full, that full immersive experience by other groups, but that these interactive components have been made available for use even in smaller pieces by other groups if they're not doing the full thing. Um, Simon Cole put together a nice educational model a module on forensic pattern recognition evidence for the National Academies that's still available. Um, we have a, gr a huge number of, pres of publications. I actually don't have all of the publications on this slide, but they're on our website. I did pull out some of the book projects working with the American Law Institute, um, Brendan Garrett on draft principles of forensic evidence, and Alicia and Hal are working with the National Judicial College on a book chapter on forensic evidence for a, a bench book for judges. And um, again, many of the same people have been doing presentations. So just as we get asked to do presentations in the forensic community, we now get asked to speak at legal events as well. Um, we've done trainings for attorneys, for judges, uh, continuing legal education events where, where people actually get credit towards continuing le legal education seminars, keynote talks at conferences. Um, so we've, we've reached a really large audience. I don't have full numbers on this one, but we've reached a large audience this way as well and um, enabled lawyers to get practice through experiential training on how to engage with forensic evidence, how to engage with forensic practitioners, how to read reports, how to ask questions. Uh, we've improved access to information by collecting reliability rulings so that, um, and I think this has been primarily targeted at attorneys in 1.0 and we're, we're broadening that scope in 2.0. And uh, a lot of the work through this program, through the legal education program has actually involved symposia that bring together practitioners, uh, statisticians and lawyers. And we've, we've launched some useful um, collaborations out of this work. So yeah, and uh, you can see the fingerprints on the screen here from, from one of the mock trial events. So that is sort of the you know, whatever 30,000 foot overview of, of where we've gotten to in 1.0, um, which we're pretty happy with. Um, as I said, we're all educators, but we were building from the ground up and identifying the communities and the relationships to make this work. And I think this has been a really successful area for us. And we are continuing to take it equally seriously as we move into 2.0. Um, almost the exact language that I showed at the beginning was in the RFP for 2.0. Um, and you know, it's, it's a, remains a very core part of the CSAFE mission. So um, this is not a flow chart, but this is, this is a list of the, of the key stakeholders that we feel it's our, it's our core mission to ensure we reach through educational programming. Obviously, forensic practitioners um, are the core clients for CSAFE, um, the people who need to be able to apply probabilistic tools in their analyses, interpretation, and presentation of forensic evidence. 
uh, the legal community will continue to need to engage with forensic analysis results in, in uh, sort of a quickly changing landscape, as we just heard. But how lawyers read, interpret, and understand forensic evidence um, is huge, actually, as, as lawyers are people who do charging, who do plea negotiation, um, who on the defense side are cross-examining this kind of evidence, and judges remain gate admissibility gatekeepers. So these are our core audiences we, uh, in, we are excited to continue to engage with. And then um, we are really expanding and sort of, we're both expanding and focusing our education efforts with undergraduates in 2.0. Uh, that may sound weird, but I'll explain it on the next slides. We're doing both, both things at once, expanding and focusing um, uh, in terms of reaching undergraduates. And we're, we're building out um, programs for forensic science graduate students. So that's a new area for this. Um, and we're really excited, Alicia mentioned, I think it's come up a couple times today, our partnership with West Virginia University. They've come on as a CSAFE 2.0 partner. West Virginia University has one of the top forensic science programs in the country. Um, one, of the, one of the only, one of the few, very few PhD programs. I mean, there are a good number of strong master's programs. Uh, West, Virginia, West Virginia University also has a PhD program. Um, so we're really looking forward to working with West Virginia University to build out um, education for graduate programs as well as undergraduate programs. Uh, uh, you know, the graduate students that have worked with us in 1.0 have primarily been the graduate students at our institution. So often in, um, you know, forensics in statistics um, or psychology or one of the disciplines that was already represented. And then we're in the process of rethinking and um, sort of reimagining our summer research experiences. And I'm going to ask for your feedback when we get to that area. So uh, the main takeaway from this slide is we have a, is we have a big team um, and we've had some uh, great meetings actually leading up to today. Um, what, came out of there, so I think we're going to have even more cross collaboration than is obvious on this slide where you see names repeated. I think we're going to be adding Simon to half of our projects and Keith Morris uh, to, to everything and uh, possibly everything on this slide. So um, we have a, a, a large um, experienced team that is really excited about working together to facilitate reaching our core audiences. And uh, Harley Judd, who many of you on this call have interacted with, has come on as our education coordinator, um, which is, I think, going to be a really helpful thing moving forward. So in terms of reaching undergraduates, as I said, we've had success reaching undergraduates in criminology programs in particular, um, and, and a, a strong pilot for reaching for a semester long class with reaching uh, undergraduate, stu undergraduate statistics students who may not have had forensic science exposure. So we um, are going to continue to build on both of those. Those are both important things to build out. But both of those courses have developed a lot of materials that we're looking forward to um, now engaging with to develop material that can be used in a, in a course for forensic science students who may not have statistics experience at this point, um, or may have some statistics experience. One of the um, you know, we've been doing background research as well as talking to programs and Keith in particular, but uh, a number of programs and the FEPAC accreditation guidelines do require um, at least one statistic. They require calculus and statistics generally to be accredited. Um, some programs have their own requirements. In addition, uh, West Virginia universities are a little higher than the accreditation requirements. One thing that's really common um, across programs as far as we've seen and this is this is not unique to forensics it comes up in other areas that need statistics but most forensic science programs seem to rely on you know a general purpose statistics class taught in a math or statistics department um, which most departments offer general introductory statistics that are you know accessible and intended for a large range of undergraduates from different backgrounds which are great core um, sort of foundational work but what we want to do is provide materials that really tie the issues and probabilities and statistics to the forensic science content. So it's not just that you go out, take your statistics, I'm just checking the time, you don't just go out, take your statistics class, you know, come back to your core subject area, but you really think about how do these issues come into what I'm learning and what I'm going to do on the job when I get out of here. So we are definitely excited about doing that. Um, and then we've had these efforts at different schools that have been 
successful so far, but one of the things that Harley is really going to help us with is collecting our materials. Um, so we have developed a great deal of educational material and we're definitely looking forward to, you've heard in a lot of areas, we want to bring in core materials so that we can identify what's appropriate for specific audiences. You know, people who do four years of statistics are going to have different needs than people who need to understand some general statistics. But make sure that we have a sort of a core collection and can can make things accessible both within the CSAFE realm, but also online and available to the community at large. Um, that's that's a key thing we want to do moving forward. Uh, so the impact is is pretty clear from this. We want to expose students from a range of backgrounds to the interplay of statistics and forensics, not just core statistics principles, but how they play out in forensics. And, um, you know, we want to see the, the field of future professionals. We want to get them engaged with these issues and thinking about them early on so that they bring them with them into their careers. Primarily, um, you know, future forensic science professionals, but also future statisticians. Um, make them aware of the really interesting collaborations, data, et cetera, that are possible in this area. So that's, that's sort of the summary of where we're going with undergraduates. Um, and we have a new, like I said, a new area in 2.0 that we're very excited about. But um, there is definitely an increasing number of, I don't know, increasing number, there are a large number of master's programs in forensic science around the country, uh, a smaller number of PhD programs. Um, but we are definitely seeing, you know, an increasing number of students go for graduate level training in forensic science. And that includes students who have an undergraduate degree who really want to continue that, continue their education before they join the workforce, as well as students who may have started out in a bench science, you know, or with some other background, but have decided forensic science is really where they want to apply themselves, where they really want to go. Um, and so one other, one interesting piece of information that came out of um, sort of our background research in this area has been so there are specific accreditation requirements for statistics for some level of statistics coursework in undergraduate programs. That's actually not the case in master's programs. There are sort of research requirements that imp probably imply some level of statistical thinking. Um, and certainly there may well be coursework in programs, but it's not a clear accreditation requirement the same way it is with undergraduate programs. So we are getting ready. We're going to be surveying graduate programs to get a better understanding of what their admissions requirements are, what their graduation requirements and expectations are in this area, and where they rely on coursework. And is it similar? Do they rely on coursework from, you know, their statistics or math department, um, or do they have their own in their research methods classes? Um, well, we know much more about our, our partnering, you know, within, within CSAFE, so I, I, you know, I understand um, at West Virginia University, they essentially require incoming students, if they don't have the classes that they would have had from their undergrad program, they, they make them up when they get here. So, you know, if they get a really strong applicant with, from a background in anthropology, who maybe, maybe, maybe they have statistics, maybe they don't, they can make that up when they get there. But we want to understand if that's the case across programs or where the needs are strongest. And then this is an area where we, we feel like it's um, incredibly important to work on having to work on helping develop instructional materials and coursework that can help promote a program, uh, you know, ideally a semester long course in statistics really targeted at forensic scientists at training forensic scientists, um, where they can see it, where we can apply this in their area. So we look forward to doing this, you know, initially with West Virginia University and then developing instructional materials that can be made available online, um, including lecture notes, homework assignments, projects and code um, to enable this kind of material to be adopted more widely um, with other institutions. And we're still thinking through the logistics of how to make this more available, um, whether this will involve some sort of train the trainer type of work, bringing people in. Um, you know, more online delivery, et cetera. Um, but we're very excited about this. Um, we see this supporting, again, new generations of forensic science researchers and directors, people going for graduate degrees or maybe, you know, future lab management uh, who really understand these issues and are prepared to work with the new quantitative tools that are being developed that we've been hearing about today that are being developed in other areas outside of CSAFE as well. Um, 
you know, to both do the work and, and report uncertainty in, in, in reasonable ways. Uh, and also, you know, at the graduate level, I'm sure that forensic science graduate students are, are really um, able to read, contribute to, participate the forensic science literature. So, um, so this remains stuff that we're super excited about and looking forward to. Um, oh, I should have put this one first, but we are building out the undergraduate research at summer re undergraduate research experience as well. So we've had a lot of success with our traditional model. Um, a lot of the research experience has been primarily pairing the students groups with our graduate students and with our researchers, which we've actually gotten really good feedback on. Uh, but we've also gotten sort of some good external feedback that it could be useful to really um, pair students with forensic science practitioners. Most of these students want to go into forensic science and we want to um, ensure that we're giving them experiences that will help not just with their understanding their coursework, but help them really prepare for the careers they want to have. So we're still thinking, we're still working out what this means, um, whether we're going to be asking you if you want to come come spend some time with us over the summer. Our research, we're going to consolidate our research undergraduate experience at Iowa State in 2.0, um, sort of the C stage mothership, where a lot of the um, structural support is. So we might ask you if you want to present remotely, engage with us. We're very interested if you'd be, if we wanted to, if you'd be interested in, if you are from a lab, which I think a large number of our attendees are, hosting a student, if maybe they come do a, an on-campus component and then a lab-based component. Um, and we do have some funding that could help facilitate sending students to labs as, as well as to Iowa State. Um, so we're not going to, reinvent the wheel from scratch. We've had a, a lot of success in 1.0. Um, we're going to continue to build on the relationships we have with undergraduate universities and forensic science and build that out. And with um, historically minority serving institutions, we've, we've been, well, we've just gotten great students from both of those and are, are really happy with the network we've built, but we're certainly happy to grow that. So, um, but this is an area I'm going to ask you at the end where we'd love to hear from you on how you would like to engage with our students. And, um, what you're looking for in student summer research experiences. Uh, I think this program continues to have a lot of potential impact. A lot of it is a lot of this is a case where there's a lot of long horizon impact. If you uh, train students in the summer after their sophomore year, you know you hope you're seeding them, um, exposing them to statistical methods early, helping them to kind of develop with this thinking in mind as they launch their career and join the workforce. Um, and we hope that in 2.0, by engaging them more directly with forensic professionals, we're promoting these career, this career option uh, for, for work in forensic science. So yeah, we're very excited about, I'm really excited about all these programs. That's probably pretty obvious. Um, this leads to, once again, our, our core, you know, our students then become forensic practitioners. Um, and we are continuing to build out our education programs for forensic practitioners in 2.0. Um, so we want to continue to deliver trainings in probability and statistical methods for the analysis and forensic evidence. Um, we are happy to come work with you at your laboratories. Um, not those of us who are currently under travel restrictions right now this month. But um, although we could work with you remotely too, we can actually, we're, we're getting better and better at remote presentations. Um, and we were always pretty good. But, you know, we want to work with, we want to work with labs sort of on an as requested and as needed basis um, and at conferences and other venues. Um, one thing we're really looking to moving forward is developing not just general forensics for pattern recognition um, or, and digital evidence or general forensics general statistics and forensic science with building modules. And this has really come out of requests from the practitioner community. Can you build modules for my practice area? Um, and so that's an area we want to work on moving forward. In um, October, CSA, Iowa State is going to be hosting a workshop for um, firearms examiners. will be a, a good launch of this. We'll, both to engage with examiners on the, the software that Heike presented this morning. So this will be actual hands-on training, hands-on engagement and feedback. So we'd like to do more work like that, um, or you know, in addition, work at, at specific conferences, maybe uh, on fingerprints at the IAI, et cetera. So that's something we're really looking forward to in 2.0. 
Um, and then also moving forward, you know, we've been building this out as we go, and we all have a, a you know, a good bit of experience in education as educators, but um, we've been very good at kind of collecting metrics on what we're doing and who we're reaching, but we now want to work on, um, on increasing the evaluation tools so we get a better handle um, on how these workshops are received, you, you know, beyond just the word of mouth feedback, which is super useful. But, um, you know, you know, tools to better evaluate and help us improve these programs moving forward and um, sort of consolidate and coordinate through our new um, educational coordinator. So this is one slide, um, but it's, it's super core to our mission and, and where we hope to have, um, you know, considerable impact. In addition to um, doing all the work we do on methods themselves, it's really important to us to work with the forensic practitioner community to um, help develop increasing statistical literacy, uh, you know, adoption of these techniques, and then reporting of uncertainty. You know, more you know, we're getting sound sound reporting of techniques, and we've we've seen a lot we've seen a lot of um, a lot of improvement in that area, and we look forward to continuing to work in that area. And, um, you know, as we move into 2.0, I think Alicia said this first thing this morning, or that, C I know Alicia said first thing this morning, that the research we do is mission driven. Um, obviously, publishing is one way that we work to get our results out into the world, but trainings are another key way that we work to get our research results out of our labs and ideally into your labs. And um, we want to we want to continue to build on that moving forward. That happened faster than I meant, but it's actually a perfectly good time to go on to the next slide. Um, so, continuing down the pipeline, I had back on slide one. As practitioners produce results, um, they go to the legal community, and the legal community has a different set of needs than the practitioner community. We don't need to train judges um, and lawyers. How to um, how to use um, you know the handwriter package or uh, the you know the cartridge evaluation packages. We don't need to do trainings on how to code in R and etc. for the legal community. Um, it's a, it's a different audience and a different set of needs, but it's crucial to um, sort of successful use of forensic evidence that the legal community understand forensic evidence, understand the core issues in statistics and probability, um, understand the uncertainties in forensic evidence and what they mean. Um, it's, it's actually, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's another really core area for us. So we have uh, the studies Brandon talked about um, a few minutes ago and understanding how evidence is received, how it's interpreted. Uh, we also have sort of a training side of that uh, to influence how evidence is understood and interpreted. So the mock trial short course, again, has been a huge success and we're going to continue, continue with that. Um, this is another area where we're going to continue to kind of where take it both move forward and in focus. So uh, Brandon and, and Brandon Garrett and his colleagues are going to be doing studies of forensic course offerings in law school, analogous to what we're doing in uh, the forensics education world to really get a handle on what's being taught in law programs so that we can complement and build on what's there. Um, and also going to be doing surveys to understand the uh, forensic training needs of judges and lawyers. So um, get a better handle on what's available and what's really needed, where we can fill in holes in those areas as well, and continue to build out our training programs to meet those needs as we get a stronger handle on, on what's needed. Um, so we'll be developing new training materials for these audiences, and also expanding the online forensics legal repository. Um, and one of the nice things there is, I think the, I think my understanding is in 1.0 that was really targeted in making admissibility and rulings available in the legal community. And we're going to be expanding the materials collected and also um, making sure they're accessible to the practitioner community as well as people working at labs may not, you know, use or have access to Westlaw, et cetera, to, to look up rulings. So the idea is um, both to track the landscape and actually make um, admissibility rulings and in, in needs accessible across the board. And one thing I also just want to highlight, it's not on the slide in the legal community, um, it's, it's an area we have traction in in a long history. One thing that's been exciting through 1.0 and that we see carrying forward is we have 
um, you know, we've had, uh, we have great relationships with a number of judges and attorneys, some of whom we've heard from today. Um, we initially had uh, our strongest support, I'd say, on the legal side and the defense bar. They were um, sort of the first group on the legal side that was more in tune to these issues and wanted to hear from us. We have, we're having increasing interaction with the prosecutorial community, um, often at their request. So the team at Duke has done a training with the Philadelphia uh, District Attorney's Office just recently with like 30 attorneys and one of the DAs is, is on our advisory board. So um, we've always had engagement with this community, but that really seems to be growing. Um, and given how forensic evidence is used, often you know, in plea bargains, et cetera, before trial, that's, that's a core community for us to work with. So we're excited to see that expand. Um, I think I've highlighted most of these things here. Yeah, oh, and, and we want to integrate, you know, what we're learning into model policy standards and practice for all of these groups. So that sort of takes us through the pipeline that I've talked about. Um, whoops, I'm going to move forward. It takes us through the pipeline that I've talked about and how we are looking forward to reaching all of our core audiences. Um, oh, I see it looks like I might have stuff in the chat. So I will pause as soon as I get through this and look at the chat in the Q&A or Stacy will help me. Um, but as, as you've heard many times today, we've also been spending time thinking about how, um, what we can ask you for while we have your attention. It was, we were really excited um, by the number of registrants for this event and we're, um, yeah, we're excited that you're interested in us and we really want to continue this uh, after this call ends today. So for our legal program, um, we have a sort of a specific need that would be helpful if people are able to share sample reports, um, especially for fingerprints and prior arms, but probably across areas. For training attorneys, it's really helpful to have reports from, from various jurisdictions, which can vary considerably. You don't actually, I mean, from where I said, I don't think you, I don't, you have to redact case information, but um, well, you probably want to, and it, certainly that's not, we don't need those details, um, but we just want to see how the, you know, get the structure of the reports um, to work with. Um, we'd definitely like to hear if you have ideas for our summer research experiences, if you would be available to talk remotely or on site with our students, if you might want to have our students come spend time with you from not just our university student, but the whole research, summer research experience from across the board. And like I said, we, there are, we do have some funding to help facilitate that um, and, and sort of help make that work. Um, if you have attended any of our trainings or courses, you know, we want to know what you thought about them um, very much. And we want to know, whoops, sorry there. Uh, we want to know what you thought about them. Uh, if you would want to be a part of our trainings or courses moving forward, if there are subject area you, you know, you're interested in that we haven't covered that you would really like to see, we want to know about all of these things. And um, as we build out new trainings, we're definitely going to be looking for places to pilot them. So if your lab is, is interested in being one of those places, that's a whole, that would also be useful for us to know, um, even if it's not something we can do for you next week or even next fall. But as we build out new materials, we'll be looking for, for groups that are willing to pilot them as this and interested in hearing them. So um, I also have how you can contact us. I just ended up on a second slide. So thank you all for sticking around. Um, I, I'm, I actually can't see the number anymore, but I saw it when I started talking and it was, it was a good number of people stuck around for the whole day. So thank you so much. Uh, you will get a survey following this up. Um, that's a great place to send us your ideas for education. That's also probably a great place to send your ideas and contacts for anyone else. And, and, our, and our team can help direct those to the right people. Uh, Harley Judd is our new education coordinator, so she can definitely help bring in feedback to Alt and get it to the right person. I'm also happy. Uh, you know, I'm going to be working on the, you know, the the primarily the graduate and undergraduate education, but I can help get things to the right people if it's not me. So thank you very much. And um, Stacy, do I have questions? Not, maybe I need to stop sharing my screen to get the things. Um Robin, could you return to slide number 14, please? And Brandon, I'm glad you're still here. I think there's a clarification um, on the point with provide resources for forensics practitioners and lawyers to understand the changing law across US jurisdictions. The question is about specifics, if you can provide any, Brandon or Robin. Brandon. 
And so uh, particularly for non-lawyers that don't have access to Westlaw and some of these legal databases, we, we would like to create a legal repository of recent and going back at least a reasonable length in time into the past to create archives of court rulings. Um, we like to cover all 50 states plus federal jurisdictions. We'll have to make sure we don't violate any Westlaw copyright. We won't use any head notes that are proprietary, but the text of the cases themselves is public record. And uh, we'd like to organize it. We have to think more about how to do this. We'd love advice on this. Organize it by state, by forensic discipline. Um, we won't, might want to think about other ways that we want to make it convenient for people to search through this repository. We've uh, done some work assembling big lengthy tables of cases that have ruled um, uh, state rule 702 rulings uh, across the state that have adopted the federal rule 702. So we've done some work that's a start, but, but there's a lot of work to do that, to create this kind of repository, which we think people would, would uh, certainly find useful just to look up recent decisions in their own state or to look across the states and see, you know, what are the, what are the recent rulings on, you know, firearms comparison testimony, but that's, that's the idea. Lynn Garcia in the chat is uh, enthusiastic about that idea, <laughs> Brandon, and supportive. So just wanted to share that with you. Um, Juliana in the chat is asking an, a sort of unrelated question here, but I just want to touch on it about facial recognition class or course that someone could recommend. Um, that is a, not an area that CSA focuses in, but I think a great resource there would be um, our NIST colleagues. I believe they have some facial recognition um, expertise and um, OSAC also has a committee which might be helpful for you, Juliana, to look um, for those resources. Robin, there were a few things in the chat, but I was able to respond to people um, specifically looking for information about our firearms workshop in the fall or that will now be held in the fall. It was originally slated for spring. Um, we are going to reach out to AFTI and talk about and think about ways which we might coordinate our event with their event because they also rescheduled to October of 2020. Um, we also, are looking forward to Forensics at NIST this fall, which is in November. So um, hoping to continue to connect at, at both of those events with, with the community. As Robin mentioned, there is going to be a survey distributed to attendees of today's um, all hands meeting. And we do encourage you to provide your feedback and give us um, any um, contact information if you'd like to follow up with the CSAFE administrative team, or if you'd like to follow up with CSAFE researchers in particular, um, we can help make those connections for you. Um, I hope that you saw some, uh, a few ways which you might engage with our team and, um, and which we might share resources or collaborate um, over the next five years. And um, we appreciate you joining us. I think there is another question in the chat I'd like to refer to. Um, I think it is in response to Juliana is some legal areas have mailing lists to which they send weekly updates. Um, maybe that's an idea. Uh, actually, I think that might be an idea for CSAFE, um, maybe a distribution idea for some of our um, resources and legal audiences, um, our materials that we develop. So um, that is a good suggestion. We will keep that in mind. Alicia, do you have any um, parting words or we, we have time on the agenda also for discussion, if anyone would like to discuss anything that they heard today. Yes, I think we just uh, see, we can open it up and uh, ask anybody in the audience to send, submit any questions or comments about anything you heard today. Um, we can give people a few minutes, otherwise we'll uh, maybe, uh, Again, I don't want to put Robert on the spot, but maybe uh, Robert has a few uh, words to offer in closing. We, uh, we can offer a few of our own words in closing too. Oh, thank you, Alicia. I thought it was a, a very valuable day today. Um, a lot of good information was imparted by all the different presentations. I'm also impressed that a, a number of uh, people, upwards of uh, a couple of hundred actually stayed through most of the day. 
for Stacy, thank you for the plug for Forensics at NIST 2020. That'll be November 5th and 6th of this year. We're intending to hopefully have that in person, but we'll have to see. Um, but we're also planning workshops in conjunction with the Forensics at NIST um, program this year as well. You can check out more information on that on our website and the registration for that event is actually open at the moment. Thank you, Robert. Um, something came through the Q&A channel. Uh, so somebody is asking whether CSAFE associated institutions have identified funding sources for current forensic practitioners who wish to pursue graduate degrees in these disciplines. Um, there's always funding for good students uh, one way or the other. So if you or somebody you know is interested in pursuing a graduate degree uh, in one of our disciplines, uh, please holler. Um, the disciplines would be statistics, law, or forensic science. Um, uh, and we, you know, we'd love to talk with you about this. So, so send an email or send, um, send a, a just send us an email and we'll, we'll provide more information. But the answer is a tentative, uh, it's not impossible. How's that? <laughs> Anything else? Um, Alicia, if you could refer to the chat. Oh, yes. Um, I'll come back to a question for you, Alicia, but a question um, for Robin mm -hmm. um, is posted in the chat regarding education and training. Have you considered developing a statistics and evaluation of, evi of forensic evidence online training for forensic practitioners, similar to what is, doing, uh, is done at University of Lucerne, conducting 90 minute presentations, four hour workshops, et cetera? Um. And maybe that's a, uh, Alicia is, works on that project specifically. So feel free to jump in Alicia if you want to um, have we, you know, what are our thoughts around providing a online content um, in CSAFE 2.0? Well, um, thank you, Jerry. That's a great question. The Lausanne people, uh, the people at the University of Lausanne have been doing this uh, uh, educate this training for, online for uh, many years and they really have developed extraordinarily good materials. So uh, yes, uh, we I uh, haven't thought of specifics yet, but I can tell you that when we do, we will look to see what they're doing because um, we don't want to reinvent the wheel here and they do have a very high quality training program. Um, any specific suggestions you have, we'll be happy to hear. Uh, there's another question in the chat. How hard is it to find really good data sets that support reporting result likelihoods? And by good, I mean satisfy all the things that give you so much trouble now. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> How about the database people? It's a challenge. Yeah. CSAFE has put a lot of work into building databases. Um, we need to discuss, satisfy all the things that give you so much trouble now. Um, you know, there's, uh, this is Roy Maxion, there's good data sets, uh, there's excellent data sets, and there are data sets that are useful in some way. And I think we're happy to try and work with anything that's out there that's uh, halfway reasonable. Uh, we're trying to fill gaps uh, and create data that we don't think exist, at least in the public domain. Um, but uh, again, if there's some uh, useful data out there that we don't know about, we'd be happy to, we'd be happy to hear about. Um, Alicia, in the Q&A, there's a question. Ah, is there an opportunity for students to do research in Canada with a forensic lab? Um, 
the I am not sure. We would have to figure that one out. Uh, if this is an American uh, student who wishes to do an internship in Canada in a lab, um, well, first of all, we would need to find a Canadian lab that's uh, that's willing to cooperate with us. And second of all, I don't know about uh, I don't know what the restrictions are money is to fund an internship abroad, but we would have to find out. Alicia, there's a few um, suggestions here in the chat. Thank you guys for chiming in. Um, Marissa says University of Windsor has a great program, so okay. that might be something for the student to look into. And Alan Zhang from NIST does have some contacts in Canada, and so that might be a good connection for um, someone looking for that sort of experience. Yeah, so we, we have some contacts in Canada as well, in particular with the Royal Canadian uh, Mounted Police. Royal Canadian Mounted Police, right. Um, and their crime lab. Uh, so other contacts would be great to have as well. The question is, I don't know whether we are allowed to use our funding uh, for that purpose. So that's something that we would have to discuss with NIST. I don't know what the issues are. But we'll discuss. And Alicia, can you talk a little bit about, um, in the Q&A, there's a question about our um, partnerships with the minority ring institutions that we have um, continued into 2.0 and kind of what your vision is for how those partnerships might look. So, hello, Khalid. Uh, thank you for the question. Yes. So. During CSAFE 1.0, we established partnerships with uh, four universities uh, that tend to serve uh, majority, um, mostly minority students. Uh, one of those uh, uh, partnerships sort of went, um, didn't flourish too much, but uh, with the other three universities, we kept some touch and mostly uh, focused on um, including their students in our um, in our internships, summer research inter internships. We haven't done a whole lot of collaboration in terms of research with the uh, minority partner uh, institutions, mostly because the research interests have not meshed. So uh, the, the, some of our minority partners have done research, do research in toxicology or DNA or some other areas in which we don't work. And so that has been a little bit of a barrier to collaborate in research, but I, it is my hope that we can find some common areas for, uh, for working collaboratively. And um, we talked, oh no, we didn't talk about this today. Yesterday in internal meetings, we talked about this issue of training trainers. And so, uh, and we specifically uh, thought about our, uh, um, uh, minority serving uh, partners because um, I think we could do, um, we would really be, um, uh, we could contribute to the programs that they uh, deliver to their students, I think, uh, at least in terms of quantitative literacy and other areas. So my hope is that we will continue our partnership um, and that we'll find uh, some ways to strengthen it uh, and, you know, broaden it beyond the, the summer research experiences for the, for the undergraduate students. Anything else anywhere? Hmm. I don't see anything else. Do you see anything? anything. Um, we oh, will. One more. One more. One more? Yeah. Oh, thank yeah. you, Alicia. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Khalid. <laughs> um, we will try to distribute um, slides and information from today's meeting as quickly as possible, along with the evaluation, the survey um, that follows up today's meeting. And we look forward to seeing you and hearing from you all in the next five years. So thank yes. you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this was uh, a long day, <laughs> but I think it went well, and uh, we very much look forward 
uh, to talk to meeting with all of you in person during the next few years. Uh, and please, you know, stay in touch. Don't make yourself scarce. We will reach out to many of you. Don't hang up on us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ah, I'm dead. <laughs>